Okay, well, thank you, Nima. And it's a pleasure to be here. Of course, you know, you see real estate, you think I can learn something today. I can learn how to get rich. I just Googled it. The Trump's book, The Art of the Deal. I first heard it here at SBE. Well, I'm going to talk a bit about real estate from the perspective of how to make money, but mostly I'm going to take the perspective of how real estate affects you, not just financially, but also from an environmental and from a health perspective. So the art of the deal, not really, but I hope to give you insights that are useful for you as a student, perhaps in your courses or maybe for your, your, your thesis later on. And perhaps later on in your business life as you venture out into the into the big world. Uh, my name is Niels Kok. I'm a professor in finance and real estate at the finance department here. Uh, I'm part of a group that's called the Maastricht Center for Real Estate. Uh, and that's a group of about 12 uh, people, uh, three professors, two postdocs, and uh, a whole bunch of PhD students that all work on topics related to real estate. And we really approach real estate at buildings from a financial perspective and mostly from the perspective of large institutional investors that invest in real estate, like pension funds, insurance companies, banks, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, you can also take the perspective of yourself and maybe hey, you or your parents bought your, your, uh, your student room or your apartment. So that's not a perspective you can take. We mostly take the perspective of, uh, of the institutional investor. So I'll take you through this. There's there's a, a narrative on this as well. There's a little book uh, that's also online. And I'll, I'll share the link after this. It's in Dutch and in, and in English. So um, you don't have to necessarily make notes because I can share most of this in, uh, in, uh, in narrative form and also the slides with you. I uh, used this talk before for my inaugural address a couple of months ago. So uh, I don't see any people that were there, I think. So it's good. I can make the same jokes again. In that <laughs> That's good. I was a little bit more nervous then because it was my inaugural address. You have to wear the toga and stuff. So it was stressful. And today it's nice. It's relaxed. So if you also have questions during my talk, please feel free to raise your hand and we can just make it a bit interactive. That's totally fine. And otherwise, I'll just, you know, talk. Hopefully you don't fall asleep. But the air quality so far, and I'll tell you more about it, it's pretty good. So hopefully that's uh, it's going to be fine. So real estate is a big part of your life. Well, picture that you probably know. Maastricht, we're uh, uh, almost here. We're, at, we're actually here at, at, the, at this point. And real estate is where you spend a lot of your time, right? So hey, what do you have? Your apartment or student room. I have my house uh, with my, my wife and kids. That's where you spend a lot of your time, obviously. Uh, but then also, I uh, think about if you're not in your student room, and of course, some of you like to be outdoors, maybe do some running or biking, maybe you go to the gym. Hey, that's again indoors. You go to a restaurant or a bar or a student association, mm, that's again indoors. And you go to university, eh, to, to go to your tutorial or a lecture like this, again, you're indoors. So you're spending a lot of your time in buildings. And through that alone, real estate is a big part of your life. And I have some stats on that later. But real estate is also a big part of your life financially. So I guess that most of you are probably renting a room. If you, uh, in, uh, in blue, look at the last dot, you see the average rent that people in the Netherlands pay to rent a room or mostly a house. And then if you go from left to right, you see the amount that people spend at different age cohorts. Uh, I, I guess some of you kind of fall to the left of this. So hopefully pay a little less. Uh, but in the Netherlands, if you if you rent on average, you pay about 610 euros per month. But if you own a home, you're like, well, I don't have to pay rent. That's great. But you typically have a mortgage, right? Because hey, you went to the bank and say, yeah, I want to buy my apartment or I want to buy my home. Can you lend me money? Can you give me a mortgage? Yeah, sure, that's great. But you have to pay that mortgage back and you have to pay interest. The time when I took my mortgage, interest rates were very low, 1.5%. But these days, you pay about 4% for a mortgage. So if you own your own home, you pay a bit more than, uh, than what you pay as a, as a tenant. You pay about 725 euros a month. But typically, uh, if you own your own home, they're a little bigger, et cetera. So you get a bit more housing for that money also. Also, what you can see here is kind of the life cycle of how much you pay um, basically when you're young versus when you're old. So relatively young homeowners that just got into the housing market pay more than older homeowners that probably already paid off a big part of their of their mortgage. And for tenants, it's a little mixed. Actually, and interestingly, 
when you're older, so you're at the 55 to 67 or older 67, you pay more in rent, relatively speaking, than, than when you're young. And you can also see that when you express these dots as a percentage of income, especially for the elderly that rent, see, if you're older than, than 67, they spend about 38% of their monthly income on rent. Uh, on average, tenants uh, spend about a third of their income on rent and homeowners spend about 23%. So that's also because people that rent generally in the Netherlands um, is the part of the population uh, that's not so well off as the part of the population that owns their house, right? If you um, have a little bit more money to begin with, a better job, it's easier to buy a house. Um, and those people spend less, about 23% on average on, uh, on, on their own home. Kind of curious, if you think about your own budget, sure that you think about your budget, maybe your parents pay, pay your student room, how much you spend on, uh, on, on rent. If you do that calculation, is that about a third? For, for whom it, would it be more? So you have your monthly budget, who spends more than a third of their budget on, on housing? Actually about a half, maybe 40 to 40% to 50%. Wow. Some other people are saying, yeah, yeah. Who spends much less? Who would spend like 20%, a fifth of their, uh, of their income on, on, uh, on housing or income or just your budget that you, that you have? I guess. Ah, that's good. I'm a bit older. You're a bit older. Yeah. And are you in the homeowner or in the tenant category? So you probably paid off a big chunk of your mortgage. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that's what you see, right? So the homeowners, they pay about a fifth of their monthly income to, uh, to housing. But as you can see, housing is the single largest expense for everybody. So whether you're a student, uh, and I guess still for you, even though it's uh, it's less than than that third that people spend on average, it's still going to be a big chunk of your of your monthly expenditures. So housing affects you financially directly, but housing also uh, ultimately and real estate generally affects you indirectly. Now I'm going to talk about your pension. It might be a little far away for most of you because you're studying. You're like, well, when I go with a pension, I'm who knows at this point it's 67. At that point, it might be 70 years old. So it's going to be a while from now. Um, I, I see some people, and it might be a little, little closer by the pension. Not, 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 a, little. a little bit closer. You're not there yet. I'm also not there yet, but a little closer. But it's important that when you think about your pension, don't think about it too much because it's still far away. You still have to work for a long time. That part of the, part of that pension is also relying on real estate. So I do a lot of work on how pension funds invest and how much they invest in real estate. And if you look at Dutch pension funds, that's the blue line, and you just look over the last 20 years, on average, these pension funds invest about 12% in, uh, in real estate. So pension funds at first invest in equities and in fixed income, I've had those courses here at, at SBE, but then the third largest investment for most pension funds is actually real estate. There are some pension funds that even invest up to 20% of their, of their wealth in real estate. And that's a lot of money. So in the Netherlands, we have about 1,400 billion uh, uh, of assets in our in our pension fund system. In the Netherlands, it's mandatory to pay into a pension fund when well when you're employed. So uh, people that work here at the university they pay their pension to ABP. ABP is about 500 billion in assets under management. So it's so it's a big part of that 1,400 billion. It covers civil servants and a lot of people in the Netherlands work as a civil servant. Um, and ABP invests about 12% of that in real estate. So when you go with your pension, the performance of real estate is also ultimately going to determine how high or how low that pension is as part of it. And that's important because once you're above 67 and you have you know, finally that pension payment coming, it's a big chunk of your income. So uh, you're the homeowner here, so I'm going to point to you. When you retire um, about two thirds of your income is going to come from a pension on average in the Netherlands. And so the, the retired people in the Netherlands, if they own their own home, on average get about 3,200 per month in income. You know, you can judge for yourself whether that's high or low, uh, but two thirds of that is, is coming from their pension. So if the real estate component of that pension is not doing so well, this might be lower. Or if it's doing very well, this might actually become a little more in terms of income. For tenants, that percentage is, is a little lower. It's about 40%. And that's mostly because uh, for tenants, 
the pillar one income. So that's basically social security is a larger chunk as compared to pension. And when you earn a little less, you also get less pension. And, uh, and the, uh, the pillar one uh, remains, it remains the same. So that's kind of financially. We'll get back to that extensively, but so so you feel that oh, real estate is, is is important, and you knew that because your student home is expensive. Um, but the real estate and the environment are also closely related. And you know the talk of uh, the, the 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 title of this talk is people, planet, property. So let's talk a bit about about planet. So when you look at energy consumption in the real estate sector, you go back a long time. What you see if you zoom into today is that about forty percent of energy consumption, and this is data for the US, but it's actually quite similar in Europe, 40% of total energy consumption in the US is in buildings. And when you look at electricity, it's even 71%. Wow, I didn't know that buildings consume so much energy. Well, that's mostly because it's the buildings where we spend a lot of our time. We need lights, we need a computer, we need an elevator. Increasingly, we're charging our electric vehicles, and that all happens in buildings. We need to also in the winter, obviously we need to heat our buildings. In the summer, increasingly we cool our buildings, otherwise it gets gets pretty hot, as you've as you've seen over the last couple of months. So 71% of electricity consumption, both in the US and in Europe, is actually consumed in buildings. And a big chunk of that electricity is produced using uh, using fossil fuels, right? Gas, coal. Sadly, we're still using or we're again using because of uh, because of the invasion of, of Ukraine, we, we basically fell back to using coal rather than phasing it out as we, as we, really, as we really should do. And that en energy consumption in housing or in real estate generally also affects you. So who knows their energy bill? So you just told me where, where you are about when it comes to your spending of your rent on, uh, on, um, in terms of income, but who knows their energy bill? How much are you spending on energy per month? You know? 100 something. 100 something. 160. Yeah. 140. 140. Wow. I'm going to ask you. 188. 188. It's oh. more than 200. Whoa. In the house? Um, it's, an no, it's an apartment building. That's a lot. Okay. Well, actually, the, the, one, uh, the 188 is, uh, is not that far out of line with what we see if we look at long-term historical data. So homeowners in the Netherlands on average spend about 154 euros on energy, but this is pre-Ukraine, right? Or it's not pre-Ukraine existed, but pre the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and tenants on average spend a little less. They spend about 100 euros. But if we fast forward, so this is pre-2022 uh, pre data, and we looked at what happened last year, is that these energy bills went up massively, right? So now homeowners on average started to spend about 600 euros. This was temporarily, this was before the price cap was introduced, which the Netherlands introduced, right? 40 cents per kilowatt hour, 80 cents per, per uh, cubic meter of gas. And for tenants, this went up to about 400. So now all of a sudden, 15 to 20% of gross income is spent on energy. Now all of a sudden, if you think about spending about a third of your income on rent and 20% of your income on energy, well, I'm spending more than half of my money on actually my house and heating my house or my room and heating my room. And I know that most student houses here in Maastricht, there's very limited incentive of the landlord to improve it because he's going to improve, she's going to improve that building and you're going to have a lower energy bill. So you know, most of you are probably stuck with a higher energy bill than you should necessarily have. So the environment and real estate are closely related. And again, that hits home financially. Now, it also hits home in a different way. And that's that electricity consumption leads to carbon emissions. And it's no surprise that if 40% of energy consumption globally is, is in real estate and 71% of electricity consumption, the carbon emissions in buildings are closely related. So if you think about where carbon is, is produced, 28% is through building. Now, I will say this is, through the consumption of energy, right? Primary, so you know, there's still buildings that use gas, obviously, and there's buildings that use diesel, uh, especially in the U.S. in the in the Pacific, uh, in the Pacific North, Northwest, and in the Northeast. Um, so, 28 percent of global carbon emissions in, is in buildings as they stand, but then 11 percent of, of global carbon emissions is from the construction of buildings. Because when you make concrete. When you make steel, uh, for example, Tata steel in the Netherlands here uh, at the at the uh, North Sea shore, 
that takes a lot of energy, both primary and, and, and secondary energy like electricity. So 11% of global carbon emissions stems from basically the construction of buildings. You can say, well, we should stop constructing, but we still need a lot of buildings, right? Not necessarily in the Netherlands and in Germany, but we need it especially in emerging markets, China, India, Africa, and, 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 and South America. But together, that's 39% of global, of global carbon emissions for the, building, uh, for the building sector. And we know that carbon emissions are not good, right? And we've come to that realization for quite a while now, but carbon emissions lead to climate change. I think uh, we by now have really assessed that causality quite clearly. Um, and carbon emissions, climate change, ultimately lead to, well, many different things, flooding, wildfires, drought, extreme heat, air pollution, and that affects you as well. When it's very hot and your student room gets to 35, that's not great. Two weeks ago when it was raining heavily, I mean, if your room was on the first floor, you were okay. Uh, but there was a lot of flooding here, for example, in Maastricht. And two years ago, we had a lot of flooding in, in, in Germany, here in the, in the Valkenburg area. So there's many examples of this, both in the Netherlands, but I'm sure that you're all from different countries. When you think about Australia wildfires, when you think about the U.S. wildfires, when you think about Canada, Canada wildfires affecting the U.S., through smoke. So New York basically was engulfed in heavy pollution and smoke because of wildfires in Canada. Well, we didn't really think about that. And that's all ultimately linked back to climate change and climate change ultimately back to carbon emissions. So we think a lot about how can we reduce carbon emissions? Well, maybe we got to start with buildings. So the third part, <clears throat> so uh, I promise to not just talk about financial, about environmental, but also about health. Is, is, uh, is this notion of indoors. So when you think about where you spend your time, you kind of, you know, you today went to university, went to the library. Well, actually you spend most of your time indoors and there's a time of use survey. It's from the US, it's a little dated, but I think it's pretty accurate in that it says that about 87% of your time you spend indoors. So yeah, you would be outside for about three hours. Well, who's been outside today already for three hours? I certainly haven't. I biked here this morning. The electric bike took me about 10 minutes. Maybe I should have a regular bike. It uh, takes me 15. Um, and that's it. Oh, yeah, I went to get a coffee at Coffee Lovers. Wow, that's five minutes, right? So basically, well, if you're lucky, you're outside for an hour. And yes, they went for a run, so it can do 30 minutes. So th even three hours outside, that seems like a lot. So this estimation of 86.9% indoors, I think, is even on the low side. You spend about you know ninety percent of your time indoors. Where do you spend the rest? This is an American time of use survey. It's kind of funny. Um, five point five percent in a, in a vehicle, one point eight percent in a bar restaurant. I hope that's a little higher for you, your students. Um, five point four percent at office or factory. I think that's relatively low. This is the full population, right? It's kids. It's working adults, it's unemployed adults, and it's uh, and it's elderly. So obviously, yeah, if you're employed, this number is much higher. You're going to be in the office. You know, we all arrived. My colleagues at eight eight thirty in the morning. You leave about five thirty six. So you're in the office almost almost half of your day. So you get a lot of exposure to buildings. And the bad thing here is that the quality of buildings is not necessarily good. So indoor isn't always great. And this is about housing. And I'm very curious about the quality of your housing. I sometimes look at student housing in Maastricht out of kind of job interest. So there's stuff for sale and I just go in and pretend like I'm going to buy it. I was taken, taken aback by the quality of, of, of the stock. And so there's a survey in, in Europe done by Eurostat on basically the quality of homes across Europe. And it says if, if there's a leaking roof, damp walls, uh, some mold on the walls, there's rot in windows or doors. And we say, well, this, this home needs maintenance. And if you then look at the percentages across Europe, it's quite stunning. So we think in the Netherlands that we have a pretty good housing stock, but still 10 to 15% of the 8 million homes that we have has some form of deficiency that can ultimately have health implications. Right? The reason that the survey looks at, at, at leaking roofs, damp, uh, moist humidity, that's bad for health. And I'll show you that in, the, in, the, in a second. Belgium, we kind of Dutch was laugh a little bit. Uh, 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 their southern neighbors or eastern neighbors in, in, in this, uh, western neighbors in this case, it's even at 15 to 20 percent. And then when you look, for example, Portugal, Italy, well, Turkey, not really part of the EU, but that's even higher than 30 percent. 
So we think our, our building stock is great. We know that in reality, it's not. And a lot of our rental stock especially has deferred maintenance. Now, we did a lot of research on the impact of deferred maintenance or low home quality on your health. So we later on go home and you know you think the quality of your, your room or your student house is not good, then this might be a little depressing because what we found is that uh, basically across the living life cycle, and I'll talk about it in a second, the self-reported health conditions of people living in not so well-maintained homes, well, I'll talk about this study a bit more in a second, is consistently lower than basically the self-reported health status of people that live in well-maintained homes. Now that sounds like you know correlation, not causation, but what we did here is we looked at a, uh, at a longitudinal survey of German data. It's called uh, the German Socioeconomic Panel Data, GSUP. Maybe the German, some Germans here know that. So basically in the population of Germany with, with a nicely randomly uh, uh, distributed survey, survey uh, technique, every year the same people are surveyed. And one of the questions is, okay, how often did you go to the doctor last year? How do you feel from a, from a health perspective? And then they can basically scale that. But also what's the maintenance of your home? Is it well-maintained? Does it need maintenance? Does it need a lot of maintenance? And then we see when people move. So we can also say, if you move from a home that, that's not so well-maintained to a well-maintained home, especially as a tenant, what does that do to your health outcomes? So that way we can establish causality, which for research is very important, right? And we want to really see that X causes Y and, and not vice versa. And that's how, how we can claim that these results are causal and just this is just a nice way of, uh, of showing it so for those people who live in homes that are not well maintained so again there's damp walls there's rot etc hopefully things that you don't have in your room and student house but maybe you do we find that the propensity to go to the doctor is about 11 percent higher so you have 11 percent more doctor visits and that of course has major implications for the healthcare system in germany but also for you as a as a person so that's physical health. One thing I always say here is that I'm really jealous of you because your physical health clearly is better than my physical health. And it's only kind of downwards, downwards from, uh, from here. The good news is if you look at mental health, at least the general news is bad. If you live in, in a home, which condition is not so good. So again, you know, there might be some rot, damp walls, single glazed windows, et cetera. Mental condition is suffering. And so if you live in low comfort, you don't feel as well. Uh, but the good news is that your mental health generally you know, is going up as you get older. Don't, don't know really why that is, but uh, I think there's a dip when you get three kids like I have. Uh, I think it's right over there. But you get your mental health gets better till about 70 and well, then it starts to go down. So that's the good thing to take away. But the bad thing here is that there's a consistent gap between uh, well-maintained homes and not well-maintained homes from a mental health, self-reported mental health perspective. And again, you know, this is a simple graph to show that, but we also establish that causally. So we go a little deeper and now we get to my air quality sensor. Uh, about six years ago, uh, we started with an experiment um, to put these air quality sensors in primary schools. So in basis school and elementary schools, basically in the Netherlands, in 300 classrooms across about 30 schools here in the area, so towards Germany, Heerlen, uh, we put, put these devices, actually you couldn't see the, uh, the CO2 level. This was all pre-corona, right? Pre-COVID, so nobody was really thinking about, ooh, if we all sit inside, you know, and I cough, maybe you get COVID. It was all before that time, you just go to work, whether you're ill or not, you know, you got to show up. We started to install these sensors. And we just put them there. We let them sit there for a period of five years, including COVID. And then what we did is we started to relate the average indoor qu qu air quality in classrooms to learning outcomes of kids. And well, we claim that the SBE has pretty good uh, teaching facilities, especially at the Pine, which is not helpful if you're a bachelor student because you're still stuck here. If you're a master student, we bring you to the Pine. And the air quality of the Pine is fantastic. You know, so you got to stay here for your masters. Um, our, you know, my, my, our rooms here, some are good, some are, are not so great. What we found in these classrooms is that, first of all, there's a, a big difference between mechanically ventilated 
that's where you have these uh, these basically these mechanical vent ventilation units here. So air is being blown in versus naturally ventilated. That means as much as you open a window and fresh air comes in, you close it. Well, fresh air doesn't come in. But whether you were mechanically ventilated or naturally ventilated, the air quality was always above, and that's a negative, the legal threshold. So the legal threshold for CO2 indoors is 1,200 parts per million for existing buildings and 1,000 parts per million for new buildings. It doesn't really matter. You can forget about that. Outside, it's 450. Inside, when it's well ventilated, see it's 684, which, which I would say is, is pretty good. That means because we're with quite a few people, that fresh air is being blown in here constantly. Obviously, if you have natural ventilation, you, know, you have to open a window. And what you see here is that, and these are, sorry, these are, um, these are the different classrooms, um, basically whether it's cold outside or whether it's hot outside, but it doesn't really matter. Even on days when it's 20 Celsius, the average CO2 level in this classroom is at 1500, far above the legal threshold. On very cold days, you can imagine that no teacher wants to open windows, all the kids are getting cold, they're all complaining. The average CO2 level in one classroom is even 3000 EPM. So that's three times, almost three times what a legal threshold is. If we then look at mechanically ventilated rooms like this, you would say, well, you know, things should be okay here. Almost always is the average CO2 level above where it should be. And only when it's kind of nice weather, so maybe then they, they open windows in combination uh, with mechanical ventilation, only then are they below the threshold and still above a thousand, which is the threshold for new construction. So first takeaway here is that air quality in, in this case, classrooms for elementary uh, school kids is bad. So ever since I saw this, I'm running around with this thing. And you know, when it gets too high, uh, you know, we got to open windows, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also fun to bring this on an airplane where CO2 levels are, and you, you know when you fall asleep, CO2 levels uh, are very high or elevated when you take off at two to 3,000. You kind of wonder how the pilot survives that, but, uh, and ultimately you, but... Uh, so then what we did, like I said, is we started to relate this to test scores. So we said, okay, if you put kids, and because these are kids between four and 12 years old, if you put kids in classrooms, which consistently have CO2 levels that are way above where you can, can be or should be from a legal perspective, but even if outside is 450, that's kind of what we're used to as human beings. Not really because we're always indoors, but you know, that's how it should be. And you're exposed to 3000, maybe, you know, you get dumber if you're in such a classroom. So what we did is we said, okay, the kids, they make tests. I don't know, there might be some Dutch people here. They make a CETO test twice per year, typically December or January, and then kind of at the end of the year. That's how we track the performance of elementary school kids in the Netherlands. Uh, ever since the age of about five, they make two tests per year. So we can really use that nicely to track the learning curve of a kid. So we say, okay, what was the average air quality from uh, when the, the school starts September to December? And then what's your test result? Then we say, okay, what was the average air quality from a CO2 perspective from January to June? And then what were your test results? And what's the change in test results relative to the air quality? Now, what we find is that if you double CO2 levels, the test scores uh, performance decreases by 20%. So that's a, a massive, a massive effect. Um, we find that basically well, overall, right? That's all exams. But we find that effect is particularly strong for math, not as strong for spelling, and, and pretty strong for reading. So especially, you know, the elements where we think cognition is important during the learning process. You really learn in the class. The effects are very strong. The effects are also particularly strong for the older kids, which makes sense because you know, they blow out a lot of CO two, and not so big. It's insignificant to you. Positive, but it's insignificant. For the, for the younger kids. And we said, okay, so if you get dumber from high CO2 levels, which is kind of one way one way to put it, um, then what happens after high school? Oh, sorry, after elementary school, when you go to high school? Because when your test scores are depressed, if CO2 levels are high, maybe you, you know, your high school advice is also going to be influenced. So in the Netherlands, how it works is that um, in, the, in the last class, that's uh, group eight, the, the sixth sixth grade, uh, so you're, you're 12 years old, you make an exit test. And that exit test ultimately determines where you go in combination with the advice of your teacher. And we found that the likelihood of going to the highest level of high school in the Netherlands, that's called HAVO-VWO, so it's, we combine that, 
And the end the, below that is the vocational. I don't say one is better than the other, but just the level one is higher than that than the other. But the likelihood of going to half of AVO is uh, is lower by seventeen percent. For those that are uh, in the, in an environment where the CO two level is twice as high as the average, and twice as high as twenty four hundred, we know there's a lot of classrooms that are at the level of, of 2,400. Not so much a mechanically ventilated, certainly a naturally ventilated. So what it means from a labor market perspective, so now you think back about your own elementary school, like, hmm, was that good? Maybe I had more potential than I, than I could really show. But what we see is that if you let kids learn in a physical environment where, you know, where CO2 levels are elevated or ventilation is bad, that may have real world, uh, may have real world outcomes on their basically their further educational career and ultimately on the, on the labor market. Because in the Netherlands, if you go to half of AVO, ultimately that allows you to go into, uh, into, uh, into university and university jobs ultimately, I don't say they're nicer jobs after, but they're certainly better paying jobs, right? So this is real world, uh, real world consequences. So until now, you see that real estate can have a big impact. These are all negative. So you pay a lot of your monthly salary to rent, to energy. Real estate is 71% uh, of electricity consumption, 39% of global carbon emissions. Uh, and then the air quality is also generally bad. So, okay, you walk, you walk out of here pretty depressed. So let's talk about real estate as a force for good. What can we do to change this? Well, the good news is we can do a lot. So let's start with the environment. So first about this 71% of electricity consumption, 40% of energy consumption in buildings. Can we change that? The answer is yes. We did a fairly simple uh, experiment with a local insulation company. Um, I moved to Maastricht about uh, three years ago to a uh, home of my uh, other real estate colleague. And as it turned out, even though we had done research together on energy efficiency, the house that I bought from him was energy label Red was bad. So, you know, I bought it and I thought, okay, I got to practice what I preach. I got to start insulating this home, put solar panels on. Set. So an insulation company came and Maurice from the insulation company, Bameco, he said, Niels, this is great. I'm going to save you 20% on your energy consumption. Or now you're going to pay, get this back, to this investment in five years. I said, wow, great, Maurice, that's fantastic. How do you know? It's like, well, I know. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't tell you, Maurice, but I'm a professor and... Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I believe you. It's like, yeah, no, that's what we kind of know. So, okay, well, I said, Maurice, we have a deal. You can insulate my home, but I want to get your data. So he said, okay, that's a good idea. So uh, we found uh, a student assistant, uh, and the student assistant went in, and I look at, at Enver here because he's doing student assistant work. He didn't have to digitalize files, but that student assistant did, went in, digitalized, digitalized about 5,000 insulation contracts, and then what we did is we matched that to actual energy consumption data of people that insulated their home. And we also created a control sample that looks and feels very similar to the people that insulate it. Because obviously people that insulate their home might be a little different from people that don't insulate their home. And then we had both tenants for which the insulation decision is made by the landlord, your landlord. You're not designed to insulate your student house, but it's the landlord. And we also had actual homeowners. And what we found and this is kind of the pre-trend on the left. So this is year zero. Here the insulation comes in. The year after the insulation, and you can, for example, look at the black one. It's owner-occupied homes. The blue is private rental. So that's you. And the orange is social housing. So that's that's that. The, one, the, the corporation homes that everybody wants to live in because they're good quality as, as opposed to the private rentals. But on average, energy consumption or gas consumption in this case went down by about 20%. So quite substantial. I'll talk about payback periods in a second, but I thought that was quite a substantial effect. And what's very important is that that effect is consistent for a period of six years. And then we had to stop measuring because we didn't have enough observations. Uh, and the effect is also quite similar for both owner-occupied homes and rental homes. Rental homes, the effect is even a little stronger, I think because the, the quality was a little less, less to begin with, um, or and it's, it's, uh, it's a more independent selection because like I said, you don't decide to insulate your home, but it's your landlord. But on average, energy savings of about 20% when you insulate your home. Wow, that's great. What about commercial buildings? What about schools? What about hospitals? What about universities? Can we also save energy there? So we did another study and we said, well, 
if you change the lighting in a building, and so for example, this is uh, this is fairly efficient lighting, but in many buildings where you are, look, maybe when you come home at your own student home, there's still these old incandescent lighting, and that's highly inefficient, and it's burning you know, almost all day. So what we found is that if you replace lighting in commercial buildings, you can save 9%, almost 9% in terms of annual energy consumption. That's massive. If you change the heating and ventilation system, you can save about 9% in terms of energy consumption. What doesn't seem to work so well is tell you how much you consume and hoping that you change your behavior. So we call that occupier engagement. You see that it's negative, but it's not significant. So there's been many experiments where I say, you use a lot, you don't. And you're gonna adapt your behavior to resemble your, uh, your peer more. That doesn't seem to work in, uh, in commercial buildings. So that's an energy energy story. What about what about health? So we looked at an office building in Venlo. Venlo, Venlo, the city of Venlo had the idea to build a healthy building. So they convinced the municipality uh, that they they were going to spend a little more, about three and a half million euros more, uh, to build a building on the total budget of forty million, so about ten percent more. Um, and they split part of their workforce from this existing building. It had been renovated, but as you can see, it's a bit like our building here, right? So uh, we call it the old building. Um, and then half of the workforce, 70% of the workforce went into the new building with ventilation based on, on, on natural, how do they call it? Natural circulate, principles of natural circulation. So have a green lung on top and the air goes in at the bottom. And you know, it's, it's from an air quality perspective, it's fantastic. And what we did is we surveyed all of the people working in Venlo. So we said before uh, every, or half the population moved to the new building, said, are you happy with this building? But also do you have sometimes dry eyes, kind of a sore throat? Those are sick building syndromes. Um, so next time you have dry eyes, you're like, that's a sick building syndrome. <laughs> but you get that often in buildings that have poor ventilation, you know, you get this headache. If you're here in some of these tutorial rooms, and we're in it way too much, and, and the window's closed because it's noisy on the street, you're in it for two hours, ah, you're like, oh, I'm happy to get out. Well, that's a sick building syndrome. And before, actually, some of the people in this building moved to the new building, the orange is the population that stayed in the existing building, the blue is the population that moved to the, the new building. The percentage of people with sick building center was pretty similar, about 42 to 44%. Everybody, almost half of the people there were complaining, yeah, it's not a great building to be in. Well, sadly, half of the people that were in this building stayed there and the other half went here. It was randomized. So some people were sad, some were happy. And then we did the survey three times again. And consistently what you see is that the people that moved to that healthy building reported way less in terms of sick building syndrome. You know, they, some of them still had uh, had uh, had a dry throat and and uh, and uh, a red eyes and headache, but twenty two percent less based on the formal estimation as compared to the old building. So people were much happier, happier and healthier. What's also important, I'll talk about it in a second, is that sick leave went down by about two percent for those people that moved into the new building. New building that's also a healthy building. Well, that's all great, but building this building took 40 million, right? The university's poor. They can build it to pine, but it's hard for them to, you know, to renovate this, apparently. So what can we do with simple interventions to improve air quality in homes? What can you do? Well, you know, it won't surprise you. You can open a window. Or if you're in a building with mechanical ventilation, you should actually switch it on. Many of the schools that we, uh, that we looked at in, in our study the uh, the janitor, the concierge in Dutch, would say in the morning, like, well, today it's okay, weather outside. I'm going to switch the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the ventilation on a little bit because the teachers can open the windows. Teachers wouldn't open the windows, so air quality was still bad. After Corona, that changed. Corona, you still have to think back. But what happened with Corona, when we reopened our schools, we said all the janitors have to put their mechanical ventilation on, on 100% just during the day, not at night. And all teachers have to open windows. That was the post-lockdown protocol. And the teachers did it. When the kids just had to bring sweaters and here at the university, your window always 10, 10 centimeters open. You see, we kind of forget, right? Our memory is a little short, but this always has to be open at 10 centimeters. 
well, it's mechanical ventilation, so it's not that important, but it's important in many of the rooms that we have here, we don't have this mechanical ventilation. What we saw, and I think especially for naturally ventilated classrooms, the results are quite stunning, is that these are average CO2 levels before the COVID lockdown in classrooms, 1931. Well, I just showed you that that's way beyond where it should be, right? It went down on average after the first reopening with 600 ppm, and that was pretty consistent. Then we closed the schools again and we reopened them, and it was pretty consistent with the uh, with the second with the second period. And that alone, this change of 600 ppm, the impact of that on learning outcomes is much larger than the negative impact that COVID had on learning performance of, of kids. Nobody talks about that. Everybody says, oh, COVID was bad for learning because the kids were at school. I know all about it, three kids at home. But this, the fact that we afterwards started to open windows really compensates for that and more. Mechanical ventilation was also an impact, but CO2 levels were a little lower to begin with, still too high. And they went lower because now all the janitors actually switched on. So that was a simple way to actually change air quality. And the same holds for you. If you're in a tutorial and you're not all going to bring this, some tutorials actually have something like this on the wall. Open the window. It's very important. Not just before a tutorial, but also during a tutorial. Wear a jacket, wear a sweater. You're going to be smarter. I tell you. <laughs> Now, it's very important because we're at the school of business economics is that you can do well by doing good. I once wrote a paper called Doing Well by Doing Good Green Office Buildings. And what we, what, what we do to understand whether you can do well by doing good is that we look at a simple finance framework, right? So most of you have followed finance uh, 1.5. So you have kind of banned it from their memory. But it's an important course. One of the things that you learned there in, in capital budgeting is that how can you see whether an investment is, is a good investment, but you take the investment that's minus I, you look at the cash flows that come in over the time, you discount it back by one plus a discount rate. And then, you know, you have to discount 10 years in the future. Well, that means that you do to the power 10 and then you have a terminal value at the end. And if the NPV is positive, you do it, right? The other way to look at it is that you calculate and you put NPV to zero, you calculate the R. If the R is higher than your expected or required return, you make the investment. Well, that's, that's back to finance 1.5, but it's important to look at some of these investments in energy efficiency and healthy building from the frame of finance, because you're not going to do this as an investor, as a landlord, if it's for the greater good. Right? Some people may do it, but most people won't. So first, let's talk about a simple example, and we don't do a full you know, MPV ca calculation. We just do these simple payback periods, because I wanted to compare my payback period with what Maurice of Bameco told me. So we know that insulation, uh, the average investment, it's not much, by the way, 1,640 euros, and this is pre-subsidies. So uh, for, th for those gentlemen, and, and, and you may own your own home, everybody actually who owns their own home, you haven't insulated it, you should really do it because the investment is relatively low, 1,640 on average, and you also get a subsidy. The annual return, this was pre-energy pre, um, pre uh, energy price spike, 18.3% and a simple payment period, 5.5 years. So Maurice was kind of about right. There's a difference between wall insulation, floor insulation, and roof insulation. The best thing to do is wall, floor as a longer payback period, still pretty good, and a roof insulation uh, uh, payback period of seven years. This was all pre-energy price spike. Then we look at 2022 prices. And you see that the payback period on insulation, and the price has gone up a little bit. Maurice told me, he said, there's a lot of demand. Supply, you know, is, is constrained, so I can raise prices. Yeah, they're smart, these insulation guys. But the payback period now went down to 2.4 years and the return to 42%. So for your comparison, as, you know, students of business and economics, I put long-term returns, about 30-year returns on other assets here, stocks, 8%, bonds, 5%, infra, 10, real estate, 8, private equity, 12, hedge funds, 4. Hedge funds, four. Insulation beats everything. Put your money in the cavity wall. That's that's where, where you should put it. It's not a lot of money that you can put there though, but it's a great investment. What about the return to green building? So green building is a bit more holistic. It's it's like Artapine, it's like Venlo. So we don't know a whole lot about cost estimates. There's just one paper. Um, we know that on average, it costs about 7% more to build a building in a green way. And so insulation is just one element of that. 
The green building might also have uh, bike racks. It may have uh, better ventilation quality. It's much more holistic than just energy efficiency, uh, good glazed windows, solar panels, heat pump, et cetera, et cetera. So on average, that costs about 7% more. But if you go for like a super green building, and we measure that typically by green building certificates, it's called LEED, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. BREEM is the, is the European standard. Both Qualité Environmental. DGMB, that's the, the German one. I won't even try that. But So there's a couple of different schemes. If you go for a super green building, you see that it costs substantially more, right? 13 to 14%. But if you go for the average green building, it's about 7% more expensive. Well, we did a lot of research on how this greenness and energy efficiency gets capitalized into commercial building prices. We found that rents in these buildings are a little higher, 3%. Cash flows, so that also takes occupancy into account, 7% higher. And also when you sell these green buildings in the market to investors, they yield about 13% more. So if you compare that to 7%, that seems to be an MPV positive investment. Now back to your home, to your landlord. What about energy efficiency in homes? We can look at insulation, that's just one measure. We can also look at the energy label. And most of you might be familiar with it. In all countries in Europe, there's this A, B, C, D, E, F, G label. In Germany, I think it's only till F. And all countries do it a little differently, but the gist is the same. A is good, G is bad. And G is red, A is green. And there's now also A plus and A plus plus and A plus plus plus. We didn't really realize that when we designed it about 15 years ago. But we've done a lot of work on, we now sell a home with a G label in the market. Um, yeah, how, how is that priced? And what we find that on average, it sells for about 5% less as compared to a similar home with a D label. And what's the difference there? Well, double glazed windows, solar panels, um, um, might be in heat pump, but probably just a gas heater that's more efficient. So things that you can really observe as a as a um, as a prospective buyer. And A labeled homes they sell for about ten percent more. And why is that? Well, because your energy bill is going to be lower, plus comfort is going to be higher. <clears throat> and you know from the study that I showed you, is that that increases your health and your happiness. So that's important. Thank you. Yeah. How much is the cost return for you when you? Pay for really good question. Mm -hmm. So the marginal cost of improving your home, and these are engineering estimates, is about 4,000 per label step. So imagine that you go from G to C. I think that's the example I had here. That's four label steps that will cost you about 16,000 euros, which I think makes sense. It will be the installation, 2,000 euros, solar panels, about 8,000 euros, and 4,000 for a, new, a new, uh, new heater, new gas heater, an efficient gas heater. And the benefit of that, so basically that's about, uh, the difference between G and C is about 7%, 700%. At current prices in the Netherlands, median home price is 400,000 euros. That's about 29,000 euros. So that's purely the capitalization of that investment. So that's fantastic. Plus you have the lower energy bill during the time that you live there. But this is very hard. I mean, you should take this to your parents. If, if anything, just this slide and say, when are you going to improve the efficiency of your home? They're all going to say, well, maybe we live here for a couple more years. I don't know. That's what my mother says. And I'm like, mom, just do it. You're going to enjoy it. You know, more comfort, lower energy bill. And at the time that you sell it, this will be capitalized to the transaction price. So, but it's, it's this is something that well, we started working on uh, in 2011. And it's still, many homeowners are hesitant. They say, well, I don't know. I don't know. When I sell my home and there's solar on it, are people really paying more for it? And you ask a broker and the broker says, I don't know. Even though things really have changed since, um, well, since energy prices started to go up last year. Now people realize that, that this really matters uh, uh, for the price of a house. So again, this is not like a full, a full MPV, but you, you see the picture pretty, pretty clearly. Now, investing in health, um, I told you about Venlo. So um, the marginal investment in this building, yeah, from, from making it an otherwise kind of a normal building without uh, all the health features, the green wall, natural ventilation, the marginal cost, the extra cost to make it healthy was 3.4 million. They had to fight hard with the, uh, with the mayor. 
but already on the operational cost savings, simply because that natural ventilation and not mechanical ventilation is 17 million over the lifetime. And then what we calculated additionally is that they're going to save 2.5 million in wage cost. So a, a relatively small municipality like Venlo already spends four, uh, 54 million per year on their employees. So if you can reduce sick leave by 2%, uh, for that 54 million in terms of uh, in terms of paycheck uh, that leads to capitalization of about 2.5 million so that already alone almost offsets the marginal investment but they never thought about this so this was kind of a bonus a bonus to begin with or actually to end with so i start a bit negative now i say well life is good so why aren't all, all buildings healthy and green why is your student home still you know as it is and that's because one of the reasons is, I'm going to give you some more reasons. One of the reasons is, is that our building stock is old. So we're, uh, let's have to look, we're here, I think. See? Yeah, we're here. So building is here. As you can see, most of the buildings in the inner city of Maastricht, they're really quite old. And they were, they were built two to 300 years ago. And that's not necessarily the case for your uh, for your student house, because if you go further around, they're a little, they're a little newer. But 50% of the Dutch building stock and it also holds for Germany, is older than 50 years. Now, our big building boom was uh, was after, after the Second World War, really started to produce a lot of homes. And that was also a time that we just built quantity and not so much quality. Um, that changed later on. And newer buildings, we have to adhere to energy efficiency standards, et cetera. But that's a very small fraction of the total building stock. We aim to build 100,000 homes per year in the Netherlands, uh, but we actually build only about 80,000 per year and next year probably less. That's just 1% of the total building stock. So if you have to rely on new construction for everything to improve, that's going to be very slow. The challenge is really in the existing building stock, especially for those homes that are about you know, 40 to 50 to 60 years old. And these are typically the wanted homes, the, 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 the homes built in the 30s and, and before. And people tend to invest in those quite well, but the buildings built after the Second World War is where, where the challenge is. Now, when we look at energy efficiency of the building stock, we can again look at energy labels over time. First of all, about 40% of our stock is not labeled, so we don't know how efficient it is. Um, but about a bit more than, uh, than, than 40% of our stock is ABC. So ABC is considered generally green, even though yeah, you could argue is label C really green. But 40% of our stock is ABC is, is, is relatively efficient. So that's a, that's a fairly small percentage. 60% actually is, uh, is, uh, is not. So what do we need to do? Well, a co couple of things. So first of all, I think that we uh, need to step away a little bit from energy labels and start thinking about how much does a building actually consume. The problem with energy labels is that uh, maybe your home is, is label A, but if you heat it up to 25 Celsius, you still consume a lot. And we found that there's a very strong rebound effect. In efficient homes, people use more than you expect. And in inefficient homes, if you think about, again, if you have a single glazed room, well, you just put the heating a little lower and put on a sweater because you can't heat it, heat it up anyway. So this is design-based benchmarking where we need to go is benchmarking buildings on how much they actually consume. I think that's that's a fair comparison and looking just at how the building can perform based on an energy label. The second thing is that we need to start to regulate. And we've started that in the, in the Netherlands and in the UK. And I think we should also do that for the housing market. So in the Netherlands, um, if this is a building stock, and this is basically the full distribution, um, here's the energy intensity. So here are the inefficient buildings. And here are the, uh, here are the efficient buildings. Um, what we see is that everything that's below label C in the Netherlands from an office perspective can no longer be transacted. And in the UK, that's at level uh, at label F. There's talk now of also introducing this to the rental housing market for 2029. I'm sure you've never asked your landlord for the energy label of the building, but it's interesting because if it's E, F, or G, he or she, should not be able to rent out student rooms or apartments in 2029. So the landlord will be forced to make an investment to improve the building, which I think in the case of rental homes is really good. Why? Because your landlord or your, yeah, your house boss, he or she doesn't have any incentive to improve. 
because they improve the home. Technically, I think they should just negotiate with you and say, I'm going to reduce your energy bill. They want to increase the rent a little bit. The way that a landlord typically thinks is like, okay, I'm going to spend this, whatever, 16,000, probably a little bit more for a student house on improving the home. And you as the resident are going to get the benefit. Hmm, that's not okay. So I rather don't make the investment. And that's why typically rental homes, the energy efficiency is, is, is quite bad. And that's where regulation can help, right? That's a market failure. And I think that's, I'm not pro-regulation, but that's, I think, a point where regulation can help. It's 2029, so it's not going to be really useful for you, I guess. But uh, but but who knows? Maybe the the idea that uh, that there will be regulation is going to nudge landlords are ready to do something now. Same also on on, uh, on health. As an university is very proud, uh, we have this this the pain kazan. It's great and it's well certified, uh, but it's not based on actual measures of performance. And if we take actual measures of indoor air quality, those are pretty bad. Remember, this is what regulation prescribes. This is where the reality is, and that's because this is. What regulation says, I don't fully understand it. I'm not an engineer, but basically I think what it me means to say is if you build uh, an office, there's, it's some type B3, this is the ventilation rate that you need to achieve. Well, you know, who knows? If we're sitting there with a lot of people, the reality can be, it can be quite different. So we also need performance-based uh, measures or regulation for schools, for universities, for hospitals, for offices. And then we need a lot of capital. So it's an estimate that we need about 200 billion uh, euros to improve the building stock. Well, I don't really have 200 billion. I, I told you about pension funds in the Netherlands collectively, there's 1400 billion in our pension funds. That's, you know, we're not gonna spend that on energy efficiency. Um, so if we would go green gas, the green gas route to get the, the Dutch building stock to zero, We'd still spend 75 billion. If every home gets a heat pump, gets insulated solar panels, we're going to spend 200 billion. So question is, who's going to pay for this? Well, I think there's there's a variety of ways, and the complexity is mostly in the place where you live, in rental homes and buildings. The complexity is not so much in the home where you live, for example, because what I just showed you is if you make an investment in insulation, the payback period is 2.5 years. You make an investment in your energy label, you can get that back when you sell your home. So there's other ways where, for example, you can go to a lender and say, can I borrow money to improve the energy efficiency of my home? So I don't think the problem is so much for, for the owner occupiers. The problem is really in the rental homes and buildings, because when the landlord invests, you as a tenant get the benefit. The landlord is simply not going to invest. So we need regulation, plus we need financing. And then if the landlord is smart, the landlord negotiates with the tenants and says, hey, I'm going to improve the efficiency. I want to raise the rent. And I'm going to guarantee you that the service charges are becoming less. Um, and the financing for this can go, it can come from banks. It can go, uh, come from the European Investment Bank. Uh, it can come partially from, uh, from the government. So what about institutional investors? Maybe you've heard of the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. That's, uh, that's something that we talk about a lot in the, uh, you know, master of sustainable finance that we uh, that we teach, uh, but nowadays the EU has prescribed what are green investments and non-green investments, and with everything that the EU does, it's somewhat complicated. They've said there's Article Nine funds, Article Eight funds, and Article Six funds. So if I invest in an Article Nine mutual fund, I invest in a fund that only makes green investments, and I think we need some form of designation for institutional capital to flow into energy efficiency. But then energy efficiency should also be an Article 9 product, but energy efficiency is Article 8. Now, this is fairly technical, uh, but it's very important that we give good guidance to pension funds on how they can help with the green energy transition. And currently, that guidance is not very clear. What about subsidies? So that's a very sensitive topic for, uh, for economists because we think that subsidies are typically distorting the market. So, and, and they do somewhat because... You just saw the payback period for insulation. We still subsidize insulation. I said, well, why do we subsidize something that has a payback period of two and a half years? But we don't subsidize battery storage. So we install solar. Nobody installs batteries. And we complain about the fact that on a hot day, we have way too much solar and wind energy. So what we should do, like Belgium and maybe Germany, I don't know, you probably know, we should subsidize battery storage so that everybody who puts solar on the home 
also puts the battery there. But currently, batteries are still quite expensive, so nobody's doing it. So we're subsidizing the wrong things, which is not surprising because that's how the government works. So we subsidize insulation. We luckily, no longer subsidize solar PV. We subsidize heat pumps that's needed. We subsidize window replacements, somewhat needed. But there's no subsidies over here, and that's really where we need where we need subsidies. I'm almost done. So what will the future bring? Well, the future is already here. And you've realized that the future is here because your energy bill went up and some people pay like 200 euros now for your energy bill relative to rent of four or 500 euros. So this is what happened to uh, retail energy prices last year or yeah, actually since, uh, since mid 2021. The government has now kept uh, retail prices at 40 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. I'm not sure whether you've seen that in the Netherlands, we're protesting heavily against fossil, uh, fossil fuel subsidies. We're blocking the highways close to The Hague. But nobody's complaining about the price cap that we put on this, right? But that's also subsidizing. So we're spending in Germany 80 billion euros per year on subsidizing, uh, subsidizing consumers through this price cap. And in the Netherlands, it's 12 billion. Smaller country, but still a lot of money. So the future is here. And that future is also reflected in how energy efficiency comes back in the housing market. So my mother just bought a new home. Solar old home that has a you know an energy label of uh, I think F or G, um, and when she bought a new home, we were walking around with the broker. The first thing that that the broker, the realtor, talked about was energy efficiency, and I was surprised but also a little happy. He said, "Ah, oh, this home is labeled G. You have to do a lot of work. This home is label A." What he didn't talk about is that the A label home, you know, sells on average now for thirty five thousand more as compared. To the um, to the uh, to the G label home. So yeah, you can see it here. I think this is the difference between G and uh, and uh, and C. So this difference in energy efficiency, how that's capitalized, has really changed with the increasing energy prices. One more thing: you're all gonna be in an office one day, sadly, maybe, truly, um, or not. You're gonna work from home. But the commercial real estate market is really going through a lot of changes. The commercial real estate has mostly offices, but also retail, logistics. And what we've seen in the US, this was pre-COVID occupancy of offices that has come down a lot to zero and then has improved ultimately, improved to about 50%. So offices these days are occupied at about 50% of what they were before. It's quite interesting to think about that, right? So in terms of days, it's typically two to three days a week that people go to the office. You also see it here when you go to the second and third floor, you walk around there, you see a lot of empty offices. So my question to you would be, what is the office that you're going to work in? What is the office that you want to go to? You know, is that a little cubicle with bad air quality? Or is it a place like it? <laughs> so I teach the course real estate finance and I take uh, the whole group of students, uh, 110 last year uh, to a city. We've been to a lot of cities. We no longer fly to cities from a sustainability perspective. But this was in Amsterdam. This is called the building. It's the edge. And this is an, a building that was renovated. So it's an existing building that they fully stripped. They left it in place because now you don't have to put a new concrete uh, with no CO2 emissions. Uh, this used to be an outside garden, but they put a roof on top. So it's now an, a, a super cool atrium. And the same company that redeveloped this is building the DSM headquarters uh, next to the station. Uh, if you come from the Wilhelmina Brug, you, there's a new building in construction. It's the same same uh, same developer. And they build buildings that I think people want to be in and you want to be in. And one of my main research questions is, if you build healthy buildings, green buildings, are those going to be the buildings that are going to be empty or, or half empty? Or are those going to be the buildings where actually, actually people want to, want to be? They also have a really good coffee shop, so there might be a confounding factor there. Now, the world has woken up to this, and there's a lot of press around how green buildings perform in the market, that there's a strong premium. Uh, for me, it's great because I've been uh, I've been talking about this for 15 years. Uh, so here's CNBC saying green offices are 25% more expensive. Um, here it says something like green buildings are increasingly popular. So it really seems to be that the world is catching up or waking up at last to the benefit of green, healthy, efficient buildings. Now, I didn't really talk about climate risk, but... I do think that we're a little late in the game with reducing our carbon emissions and that climate risk is happening and that we see the effects of that everywhere. And we see the effects close to home, close to your home here, and probably also close to home in, uh, in the country where you live. So 
one of our research lines and an important research line is the implications of climate risk uh, in terms of financial wealth, in terms of home prices, in terms of financing costs, insurance costs. And when you maybe find your home, uh, when you're going to finally buy, buy a home or an apartment, I'm curious whether when you walk around with a realtor, the realtor is also going to say, this is a great place because it's never going to flood. Um, that's information that now in Belgium is already mandatory uh, when, you, uh, when you buy a home. In the Netherlands, nobody talks about that. But we do know that flood risk is, is, is very important. We gave a talk of flood risk two years or two weeks ago, and I showed a picture of my garden, which is totally flooded. And I never thought about it, but my home is a little lower than the road. So yeah, when there's a lot of rain, you get all the rain in your garden in your house. And I didn't think about it when I, uh, when I bought it. And then another element is, is, is health. Um, as it relates to uh, to climate uh, climate change, but that's for later. That's maybe the lecture in in, in two years. So we we'll first got to do some work. So I want to thank you for your attention. I, I think we have some time for questions or or maybe during drinks because I took way too much time. But uh, and I, then I want to say there is uh, slides, etc. If you want to look at some of this, so uh, thank you. Or ask some questions if you have any. Um, for those who are just listening, please do me a favor and tell us how we can improve this lecture, these lecture series, because this is the second one that we've done so far. And I'd like to organize more of these. Um, and it's, it's really short, there's only eight questions. Um, you can even tell us what type of topics you'd like to hear. Uh, yes, questions on, on the quality of drinks also here, because then it's too early. <laughs> maybe, maybe for the quality of drinks, you can write me a note and then hand me that later. Um, but yeah, I would really appreciate it. Thank you guys for your attention. Thank you, Niels. It was a really interesting talk. I actually really liked it. Good. Any first questions? Otherwise, we can just go to drinks and, and you can ask me any anything there. That was so yeah, I was just wondering the, yeah. the the cost of actually doing these renovations for yeah. energy efficiency and the environmental footprint of those processes like construction and such, are those included in, in this kind of yeah, that's a great that's a really good question. So one of the things that's currently not included and but that's very hot in terms of discussions is the embodied carbon of it's a bit like EVs, right? It was the embodied carbon of the actual heat pump. So I think we first underestimated the carbon emissions needed to make a heat pump. So when you look at the life cycle analysis, life cycle analysis is not just oh yeah, how much does the heat pump use in terms of electricity, but also how much emissions did I actually emit to make it? It's like the EV conversation, right? If it takes a lot to get the lithium out of the ground, to ship it, to process it, and then to put it in the car, well, you know, is, is an EV still environmentally attractive? It is, but a little less than if you purely look at, at operational use. So the embodied carbon is something that, that I think the real estate sector is really starting to wake up to, especially because such a big chunk, 11% uh, of global carbon emissions is from construction. So you can build a super fancy new building that's net zero. Yeah, sure. But that also means that you have to take something down. You have to produce concrete, steel, et cetera. So it's probably much better to take an existing building and to replace stuff in there. But even there, if you put in new windows, there's no real life cycle analysis consideration yet. So, but that's, it is something that's, that's very much coming now. Yeah. Yeah. So the DSM headquarter is using part of an existing building and then they're kind of attaching a new building to it. Yeah. And also trying to use recycled materials, et cetera, et cetera, which is hard for concrete, but that's, that's really starting. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, so you mentioned a couple of articles that uh, touched upon the benefits of renovated homes on health benefits. Yeah. Uh, so how exactly do you measure something so intangible as health score or especially yeah. mental health score? Yeah, yeah. So the so the German socioeconomic panel um, has these two measures of self-reported health where they ask people in a variety of ways um, mentally how they feel and then they translate that in a score and they've been doing that for, for 25 years so they've become pretty good at it if you compare the same person over time right so then within person it's it's quite good 
Um, and then for physical health, it's a little easier because, because you can actually ask for symptoms, right? Do you suffer from X, Y, Z? And then the third thing that they have is, is do you, have you gone to the doctor? If yes, how often have you been, have you been to the hospital? So that's kind of the most quantitative element that, that they have. So that's what we found that in these not so well-maintained homes, the doctor visits are controlling for everything else that we know from people, their smoking behavior, their, uh, their dietary behavior. If you eat pizzas every day, well, you go more often maybe to the doctor than if you eat broccoli every day. Uh, but we control for that or if you smoke. Uh, and then we find this 11% higher number of doctor visits. So we try to combine yeah, self-reported measures, which are always weaker, with actual. And then in Venlo, the same. So we have these sick building syndromes. You know, red eyes, uh, sore throat. Well, who knows? You know, one person may say, oh, "I feel bad," the other say, oh, "I feel fine." But we also have sick leave. Well, sick leave is: Are you sick? Or are you not sick? Right? Did, did you in the system register as sick? Yes. Okay, that's a quantitative measure. So I agree that as economists, we li really like like this hard observational data, but you don't always have it. Well, then you have to rely on kind of second best, which is survey based. And again, with with this home study, we have the same person over a long time. So even if they you know, fill it out in the wrong way, as long as they consistently fill it out in the wrong way, if they move from good to bad or bad to good, we can still get to the effect that we, that we want to. So, yeah. we, we prefer hard measures, but that's hard to get access to. So in the Netherlands, we now have access to uh, use of medicine and, uh, and also doctor visits. So for everybody in the Netherlands, that's great data. There's been some literature on um, high premiums of buildings that stated that um, actually the, the very highest building gets an additional premium. Yeah. Could it be that for the green buildings, this is also the case? So, for example, the Edge is one of the, the leading green buildings, maybe even in the world. Uh, but as more of these buildings come, that this premium that you yeah. discussed becomes yeah. lesser. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So, um, So we did this work on... Are these buildings that is edge building that I showed? Yeah, it's in the, it's in, do they command a premium in the marketplace? We find yes, on average, 13%. And greener buildings get a higher a higher premium until a certain point. Uh, the real trophy buildings we didn't find additional value in, at least when we first did these studies. And then we did these studies at three points in time, three at 2007, and then the great financial crisis, so 2013, and then once more 2018. And surprisingly, the point estimates for the premiums kind of stayed the same, even though supply had changed a lot, the economic conditions had changed a lot. So at that point, we didn't see that even though supply had increased, that the premium decreased, which you may well see that right now, right? Or not. I mean, what you see now in the office market that is that the bad buildings, nobody wants to be there. And the good buildings, everybody wants to be there. So in, if anything, there could be even more bifurcation in the, in the market. But maybe we should do this study again. It would be a good master thesis also. Yeah. Right. Drinks? Yeah? Let's do it. <laughs>